Thank you so much, Jessica and Jenny. It's just an honor to be here. And of course, my favorite subject has to be young students. Um, we were talking earlier about how important it is to keep our art going, you know, beyond just while we're here. And that's going to be inspiring future generations. So I've got a lot of information and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started because you don't want to hear my philosophy. You want to see what in the world does she have to say? Okay, so I have for you, and it should come up here just in a second. Okay. And now we're going to go from the start. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna play some typical examples of beginner and intermediate players. And I want you to listen to them and see, just form an opinion. Like, do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Do you think it's typical? Do you have some suggestions? So let's take, let's take a listen. Okay, so I raised my eyebrows. So obviously you know that I think there's something that could be fixed, right? Okay, so let's listen to this next one. Okay, what would you say? Pretty typical? Anybody have a comment? Okay, how about number three? We got some, get some people awake, uh, awake this morning. So if uh, no one has an opinion or you don't be afraid to say, I mean, this is not judgmental. This is like for us to learn. So I would say those are pretty typical um, examples. Um, we have things that are not going well. Um, probably the first thing that is not going well is tone quality, right? Okay, the third example, the student was struggling across the break. The register in the second register was popping. Um, and you could tell by the way she played that she had some fingering issues crossing the break. And we're gonna talk about that today. The other two were of course beginners and tone quality was an issue for both of them. One, the articulation uh, was really heavy. So my biggest message today is that you don't have to accept that. <laughs> Okay, meet Jessica. Um, Jessica is now a freshman in the Honors College at the University of South Florida in biomedical sciences, and she's going to change the world. Well, when she was a beginner, I used my methodology and tracked her. So all through this video, you're going to see stages of her development and how we got there. Okay, so beginners. You got to remember when you're teaching a beginner of any age, they don't have any prior knowledge of the clarinet. Only what they've heard or seen, um, Squidward comes to mind because there was a whole generation of kids that would come in and say, oh, that was on SpongeBob. So remember that they don't have any knowledge on which to base decisions or do things. So therefore, when you teach, you have to simplify and reduce your choices in your instruction. Um, one of the things I think that's tough for someone with just a performance background is that often those people and students don't get a lot of information on how to teach. So they go in to a young student or maybe an adult student and speak to them on a level of like an undergraduate or music major or even a master's or doctoral student. And so you have to find your footing as a teacher to be able to explain things in a way that 
makes the information accessible, okay? And the third thing, we're building a foundation for these students. And in education speak, that would be scaffolding. So we're adding one skill each day or each week until we get the complete package. Okay, this is Jessica's first sound on the clarinet. And the message today is you do not have to accept a bad sound on clarinet. Okay, so let me see if I can get this one to play. Okay, so that was her first sound. The very next thing that I'll check for is to make sure that the 12th sounds good as well. So let's get that one to go. Oops, let me go back. Okay, so there's no reason for a beginner to sound bad. And it happens because you teach the embouchure in a very simple, systematic fashion. Okay, so here's the very first thing. Open your mouth as if you were taking a bite of food. You might even wanna have the students put their fingers here to keep their mouth open, but don't get fancy or you know real detailed, just equate it to something that they already know. And it will be a lot easier for them. Okay, the second thing, is they rest the reed against the bottom lip, okay? So you would have them open their mouth, you would help them place the mouthpiece inside the mouth, rest the reed against the bottom lip. Then you're gonna start over again and add step three, put your top teeth on the mouthpiece. Um, I really believe in teaching traditional embouchure to everybody. I know there are some who would disagree with that, but I think because of the fast pace and the need to feel successful very quickly, that it is best to teach a traditional embouchure. Okay, then the step four is just close your lips around the mouthpiece. And you'll be surprised at how naturally it will set up without having to give a lot of detail. Okay, I like to use a straw um, a lot of times if I have students that have difficulty forming an embouchure, so I'll just use a straw. And it's real, these are like real thick, big straws that you can get at, usually at the grocery store. I think they call them ice cream or milkshake straws. And so the embouchure is just very similar. Pulls the corners in, very easy for kids to understand. Okay, then step five is take a breath through the corners of your mouth and blow air through the instrument. Okay, don't get real detailed about breath or anything like that. Remember, you're introducing brand new information. Okay, now poor tone can easily be fixed with barrel and mouthpiece practice. This is the best thing that I learned in all my years of teaching is to do barrel and mouthpiece practice. And here's a video of Jessica and she's gonna give you some information about how it felt to do that. Jessica, learning to play the clarinet. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the focus um, of the sound on the barrel and mouthpiece. Jessica, what was the most fun thing about learning to play on the barrel and mouthpiece last week? What was fun? Um, just getting it to not squeak. <laughs> that's very, that's a they're very good. How did you do that? Did you just repetition? Did you just keep working yeah, at it? I just kept practicing. Kept practicing. Now your pitch is very good. It's a little bit above the F sharp, but that's okay. That's that's it's not a G. It's it's somewhere in the vicinity. Did you have a reference pitch? How did you know it was the correct pitch? What did you do at home? I tried on my piano to play. I got my brother also to play F sharp and G, and uh, I tried to match it up with those. Um, I mainly tried to match it up with F sharp, but it. Went a little it kind of sounded like it's almost in the middle. Of yeah. 
Well, goodness, your natural pitch. Let's do it one more time. Good. I want you to hold your armature. Would you form your armature and look into the camera? One of the things I want to talk to the teachers about, go ahead and form it, is that Jessica did exactly what I asked her to do so her corners would be in the right place. Her top lip is holding the clarinet, but it's not rolled under, and she's got a nice firm grip on the top of the mouthpiece. And because her lip opening is a little longer than mine, she has a little bit more flesh to squeeze in on the corners. So this makes it easier because her top lip is not completely rolled under. It's firm, but it's not rolled under at all, or, or at least not very much. I've tried to do this with students who have a longer lip opening, not the size of the lip, but the longer lip opening so that the corners <clears throat> will do what they're supposed to do. And we have good pressure all the way around from the top teeth and the corners so that the bottom lip doesn't get stretched. Okay. All right. So again, use a straw that will help set everything up if it looks weird and it may look weird when they first start, but they'll get it if you're just very careful in keeping your instruction sort of pared down and simple. Okay, so the next thing that you wanna do is introduce rhythm and tonguing without the instrument. Think about the example that, I, that was on the very first page of the kid tonguing the scale with sort of G minor, right? Okay, real heavy articulation. So go first with the barrel and mouthpiece and we're gonna to listen to some examples on how to do that. Okay, today is lesson number three. And as you heard in the first two clips, Jessica's making a beautiful sound um, on the clarinet. It's absolutely clear and very focused. Um, on her barrel and mouthpiece, as with a lot of the E11s, with the barrel being not a 66 millimeter, if it's not, the pitch is a little bit on the high side. Um, so you wanna make sure that the student has a firm grip, but they're not biting and she is not biting. Um, and her embouchure is absolutely correct. So we're gonna go with that. Now we're gonna talk about how to use the tongue on the reed to make shorter notes. And I'm gonna have Jessica just demonstrate and demonstrate that for you right now. So I want you to form your embouchure, take a breath and play some shorter notes for me using the syllable P and then T, T, T. So you can hear that she's making what we would call quarter notes, but the sound of the instrument is not changing. Let's do it again. Very good. Now let's go really fast. Let's go. And just keep going. Very nice. So the key to this, you can relax. So the key to this is number one, not to change the sound of the barrel mouthpiece. It must continue to be focused and sound in F sharp. And the um, other thing is you wanna make sure that the tone, you start with a fast rhythm first so that the tone doesn't get used to moving too much. When students are, are asked to tone slowly, the tone moves more and you get more of a scoop in the sound. So I'm gonna have her do it one more time and make the notes as fast as she can. And then hopefully we'll hear the rhythm, but we won't hear the tone. Okay, so thinking back to the example on the first page with the student who was tonguing really hard, the tempo is a big deal. Um, I know that we all like to, oh, let's go slowly. But the reality is it's probably better for a beginner to go at their natural speed. Um, some students will need to play slowly. Others are going to play medium to fast, and that's okay. Because I think the number one cause of really thuddy, poor articulation in younger students is because the tongue is moving too much, okay? I use he to start only because sometimes students will not touch the reed with their tongue because it tickles and they're like, I'm not doing that. So you don't really know that because if you're going slow and your tempos are moderate, they can breath tone and you won't even know until you get to a spot and go, oh my goodness, they're breath tonguing. So that's why I do that. But I use the air start 
only for a brief period of time. So we'll listen to a little bit of how that works. starting um, the first quarter note still with the syllable he, and there's a reason for that. The students must learn to use their air correctly. A lot of times when rhythm is introduced, the quarter notes become very short and very choppy, as in T, 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 or tha, 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 with a real heavy tone. So my theory is, if you can start with the high tone, he in the air, really steady, and have the student learn to feel what it's like to just interrupt the air, then you will have much better luck at the way the articulated sound is going to turn out. Okay, so this next week, Jessica will work on starting the quarter notes with T instead of he. But for now, we are starting them with the high tongue syllable for a reason. Okay, and here's what it sounds like on the whole instrument. Not perfect, but pretty good for, for third week. Okay. Take your time. Very nice. Okay, so Jessica's been working on forming her embouchure and playing now. This is the end of week three. And so that was a low B flat on rhythm line number one from page 10 in my book. And we do low B flats right away because of hand position and the fact that students like to prop the clarinet up on their right hand underneath the stack key. So Jessica is not doing that. Therefore, her B-flats are really nice and not squeaky. So very good. B-flat is a really good note to get down to as quickly as you can for that reason. And I really believe in that. Okay, so what do you want to tell students? Fast air, always. Tip of the tongue to the top of the reed. Don't try to micromanage. It should be one millimeter below here and that kind of stuff because the reality is we can't see inside students' mouths, so we don't really know what size mouth they have, their tongue, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, just keep it simple. And over time, you can refine it. Okay, and again, we talked about tempos. Slow tempos contribute, I think, to excessive tongue motion, which can cause really heavy thuddy articulation. Okay, now let's talk about syllables for just a minute. Okay, there are gonna be some people that disagree. They're gonna say, oh, don't use T, that's too percussive. Okay, well, maybe it is. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, anything with E attached to it is going to work. Some people like D, okay, that's fine too. But the message is you have to think about a student's language, first of all. Okay, quick story, student from Russia, I didn't have enough information to be able to teach this student and didn't do a very good job with him. And at the end of one year, he came and, you know, and said, I'm not going to do clarinet anymore. And honestly, he, it didn't sound good and he knew it. Okay. So maybe thinking back, had I known more about pronunciations in his native language, I could have helped him with that, but I didn't do a good job with that. So native language has a lot to do with it. This article is on the Van Doren site um, and it talks about the different pronunciations in languages. So you need to be aware of that um, because that will make a difference. But remember that poor articulated tone is likely caused by excessive tone motion and not the syllable that you're using for articulation. Okay, do we have any questions so far? Anybody? Jessica? Um, Jenny, nobody? Everybody's like listening? Okay. No questions yet. Do you have questions? Oh no, I don't see any questions yet. I see okay. some All right, we'll keep going. Okay. Well, good. Maybe I'm making, being clear. I hope I am. Okay, so 
I go down to B flat, as I said, um, because I think that it's important for students to have both hands on the horn. Um, I do disagree with people who go much farther than that, like down to low G and E, and we'll talk about that in a little while, because if students are young and their hands, they're just learning to hold the horn, um, then it can be problematic for them because low G is a, is a larger hole on the instrument and it's harder to cover. And we're gonna get to that in some troubleshooting tips about what to watch for, okay? So here's Jessica again. And good, and see, you can see she's struggling a little bit with putting enough air in the horn, and that's all part of it. But the sound is really not bad for, and these videos were all shot within the first, I think, five, six weeks, okay, going on. Okay, now, focus on slurred melodies, okay? Um, let students create. You're gonna hear her come in. This was the second lesson, or maybe third lesson, and she came in and she said, Professor Corley, she said, I hope it's okay. She said, this is my mom's favorite song. Now this kid had no fingerings, no nothing. She had no idea, you know, she just made it up. But it's okay, let them create. If it's not perfect, that's okay. Let it be not perfect. I don't think you can expect perfection, but I think you can expect like I have here, um, a good work ethic. Remember about the tempos and avoid at all costs. Uh, melodies that have lots of rests and complex uh, articulations because the, I think the most important thing in the beginning is a musical phrase. What a novel idea, right? And I'm not sure we do a great job of working with that. We need to let students know that in English we speak in complete sentences or our own languages we speak in complete sentences. So we want our students to do the same thing with the music, okay? Here, this is what she made up on her own and you'll love the fingering for E flat if you catch it. That was her mom's favorite song, so we did that. Okay, common uh, causes of poor tone in a student. Um, I was telling Jessica and Jenny, I just saw this in a, a junior in high school about two weeks ago with tone. He's biting on the mouthpiece because he has a long lip opening and he was never taught to bring the corners in and doesn't have enough mouthpiece in his mouth. So the embouchure is not the pressure is not distributed all the way around. So he's biting on the mouthpiece. So, and he's gonna fix it. He's smart kid, he's gonna fix it. Okay, but the number one reason that beginners get a poor tone is they're not gripping the mouthpiece with the top teeth. It's not biting, it's a grip and it has to be firm. The mouthpiece cannot move around inside the mouth. Second most common cause, airspeed is too slow. It's just too slow. The um, students don't have young students that are just starting. They don't know how much air it takes to make an instrument work. Um, one of the worst things that we can do, and I've seen this done before, is to give students a really soft read, like a one and a half, and put it on a mouthpiece that really is set up for like a three and a half or four. Now, don't start kids on three and a halfs or fours, but find something that's in the middle that almost anybody can make a sound on because the first mouthpiece they get is not gonna be the last one they have but you have, to, you have to find somewhere to start, right? So you wanna get medium everything, okay? Tongue position is low. That's another thing. People will play with low tongue position and I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna take my barrel and mouthpiece off and you'll hear this. So the low tongue position, here's regular. 
And here's low tongue position. Sounds like a party favor. And I'm also going to create a real weak grip on the instrument. You'll be surprised if you go and have your kids play on the barrel and mouthpiece, because if they're making a bad tone, you can absolutely diagnose it on um, the barrel and mouthpiece. There are some other uh, physical limitations that we can talk about if we have time. I'm going to keep going. All right. Eighth notes. Here we go. It's much easier to address tonguing issues away from the whole instrument. So if you don't like what you hear, make sure you go back to the barrel and mouthpiece and remember that tempos are important. And Jessica chose that tempo. That was her natural speed. Okay, here's a very important juncture in beginner clarinet, covering low G and learning how to play the pinky finger gymnastics as I, as I call it. And what that is, is you'll see in the video, she's covering low G and she is working to not squeak while she moves the right pinky around to the lever keys at the bottom of the horn, and then the left pinky around on the lever keys on the side. So this is pinky finger gymnastics. Okay, the lovely pinky finger gymnastics. That's a favorite exercise. I think every clarinet player probably has their own way of, of doing it, but I'm going to have Jessica demonstrate the way that I like to do it, and we're gonna let her choose which hand she wants to start with. And what this does is it helps us cover that low G, which the tone hole is very large for most young hands, keep the low G covered so that we don't get a hand position squeak. All right, kiddo, you're on. <laughs> Good, let's do the other hand. Very nice. And that's the pinky finger gymnastics. You can't teach a student, I don't think, to cross the break until they have a good command of low G. And I think it is a mistake to do so if they don't have that kind of control that was just demonstrated. Okay, chromatics, not fun, right? Okay, um, I have students and have had students who've been uh, in band or taking orchestra or whatever for several years come in and they'll see a sharp note that they're not used to seeing and they'll play a wrong note. And I'll say, they'll stop and say, wait, A sharp, that's B flat, right? Okay, and I think the chromatic concepts for clarinet are difficult. I hate to say that, but it's true. I think they're difficult because of the acoustical design of the instrument, because we skip the octave in the overtone series and go to the 12th. And so this is a frustrating time for uh, students, but you just have to keep at it. Go, go uh, do a lot of repetition. Um, don't repeat until they like scream. Um, but revisit it until they have it um, because it's very discouraging to students to have to attach new note names to fingerings that they've already learned. They're going, but wait, you know, this is this note and now it's this note. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So my suggestion for sure is to emphasize the concept of inharmonic. And this is how I do it. I have it laid out like this in my book and I teach, make sure that they see the ascending note is a sharp, the descending note is a flat. And I take just two or three notes on each line and take the time until they absolutely can identify the same fingering is a different note name. And you just have to be patient, but it's really important to approach the notes from below and above. Okay, adding the register key, um, that would come next, okay, after the pinky finger gymnastics and the chromatic, 
Um, here's another uh, thing that's really important to remember. You want to emphasize that they're new notes, but they're not new fingerings. And I like to show it this way because all the students, by the time they get here, know that that's a C, B flat, A, G, F, E. And then, hey, I'm going to add the register key and I'm going to use the same fingerings. Okay. Are they going to look at the low notes for help? Yeah, they're going to look there. But eventually, with enough repetition, they'll begin to recognize that the middle register simply has new note names. Unfortunately, the flutes, the saxophones, everybody moves faster, right, in their band class because they don't skip the octave and they a G is a G is a G, right? But we don't have that luxury. Okay, all right, shifting registers. Um, when I teach register shifts, I like to have the students use a tiny crescendo to connect. Now, there are going to be some people that disagree with that. Why? Because kids learn to blow harder in the middle register. That's what they're told. Play louder in the middle register. That's not true. Where the crescendo occurs is between the notes. And I think we all do this instinctively um, as professional players. And we just have to find a way to demonstrate and make sure we're being real clear to the students to make this happen. Um, you don't want them again to overblow and create an explosion. Um, you just want a good connection. So we're gonna listen to this video and you'll hear Jessica's connections are not perfect. And then she goes back and makes them better. <laughs> is to figure out that we have new note names, but not new fingerings. And you've done a really good job with that. Your hand position is good, everything is good. The next thing that we wanna accomplish with this is making the bottom register sound exactly like the top register. And it doesn't quite sound that way right now. So we're gonna go back and do fix one thing at a time. Think about one thing. Let's go back to the C to G interval. And I want you to play the C and make it very vibrant, real fast air high tone position and when you like the sound of it then touch your register key don't be in a hurry to go into the upper note uh -huh. Uh -huh. much, much better. Now let's try another interval and see if we can do the same thing. B flat is generally a very vibrant note on the clarinet. So we're going to also try for a very vibrant sound, high tone position, fast air. And when we like the sound of the B flat, then we're going to touch the register key. <laughs> much better. Now the F is sagging a little bit. So when you get to the top of the tube, or, or I should say, when you get to the top note, don't let the air speed slow down. Let's do that one again. Excellent. Good. Now we're going to take it one step further. Okay. And one thing you can do and you learn to do instinctively as a clarinet player is to put a crescendo at the end of the low note just before you change to the upper register. And that's why professional players sound so great is because they do that instinctively. They don't even think about it. It makes the connection very smooth. So let's try the low A. And when you play the low A, once you get the sound to be vibrant, put a tiny crescendo. You already know what that is from, from theory. You're going to get just a little bit louder. Okay, a tiny crescendo at the end of the A, then touch your register key. Good. And so what that does, as you learn to play higher notes, by putting the crescendo there, the top note just lifts out. Therefore, you don't have to push and you don't have to change anything. You're just speeding up the air just slightly before the register shift. Now, let's do all three of those first interval intervals, C, B flat, and A. Take your time. Okay, and put a tiny crescendo at the end of each note, 
that precedes or is before the register shift. Nice. Okay, so the message is you don't want them to create an explosion like we heard in the very first example when we started the young lady the notes in the clarion were popping everywhere, but there has to be something when a student is starting, we all feel it, or we, you may not now, because we've been playing such a long time, but there is an acoustical delay. So that tiny crescendo accounts for that. Um, I have heard people before say, oh no, day crescendo. Well, they say that because their students come with the middle register screaming. Okay, so I, I really think that the tiny crescendo really makes a difference and you can help students manage that without explosions. Okay, crossing the break. I teach right hand down, a little different from maybe most people. I have the students put down the low F key as well, not just uh, the three fingers over the tone holes. Um, and I think if students use this concept, that they will have a, a better chance of making a smooth cross. Okay, and right here, you'll see Jessica is playing this exercise. Um, and I like to show that the students teach them to put the right hand down um, on notes that they already know just to prepare them. And then we go and make the shift into the middle register. So these are just some exercises I like to teach three different ways and we'll just demonstrate one in the video. If I can get this to play, here we go. Okay, so now we're going to build the bridge from B flat to C. And we've talked about the fact that we really need three bridges. We need B flat or A sharp to B because that's the chromatic scale, right? And then we need B flat to C because that's gonna be a lot of our major scales that we're going to learn. And then we need A to B. So this bridge is going to be B flat to C. So let's play the first half of this bridge exercise, starting on low F. Very nice, Jessica, that's really nice. Now let's go back to the beginning of the line and play the preparatory exercise that got us there. So again, we're using the right hand down for stability at, in the beginning stages. And we're not gonna keep using that for the rest of our lives, but right now it makes sense. Okay, so let's do the preparatory exercise. <laughs> Now let's go to the bridge. Good. Let's do that again. Let's, let's go to the bridge now. Very nice. And that's how I cross the break or teach the bridge. Um, it's a point in the development that is also frustrating. Right after you've had to learn the chromatics, you go into crossing the break, but it's one that's really important um, so that those registers match and you have good hand position. Okay, I introduced scale, scales and key signatures last. Um, why do I do that? because I think it's important for the students to get a good handle on the fingerings. Um, I first, when I first started researching before I uh, did my book, um, I had a very good uh, program in the North Dallas area, test it for me and use it before it was published. And one of the things that the person who used it was a clarinetist um, with her big clarinet class. And one of the things she told me was that she felt like the students' reading skills were better. And I hope that's true um, because there are some pretty difficult hurdles that we throw 
at young students and the scales and key signatures can be introduced later as long as they have a good handle physically on how to play the horn. Um, it's not unusual for high achievers to be able to play a three octave scale to high E or F. And in Jessica's case, she was able to do that because this was a private lesson situation. So we could go at a much different pace than if we were in class. Okay, I'm gonna run through these real quickly because I think they're pretty important for everybody to know. Um, if you have a chance to help uh, the directors or whomever you work with pick beginners, take a look at their hands. That's a big deal. Double jointedness um, is hard to overcome. It can be if the student has a good work ethic. Okay, long fingers with small fingertips. Okay, this was a student that I had, an elective student, um, I don't mind telling you, um, at the university who squeaked a lot and her fingers don't look that small here, but let me tell you, when you looked at her to play, even as an adult, it was hard for her to cover the tone holes, okay? So small, and you don't see it very often, but it does happen. Okay, that one's obvious, right? Okay, you don't wanna start somebody on clarinet whose hands and fingers are just too thick to make it work. Look at, look at the right hand right here. That's a big deal. Okay, here's something you'll find inter interesting. Okay, so my guess is that person did not make it to high school band because once the tempo sped up, um, it would probably have been impossible for her to play at a fast tempo. Okay, let's look at lip openings. Okay, so long lip openings um, are a little bit difficult to deal with. You're gonna have to work a little harder uh, for embouchures because they have a lot more flesh to squeeze in towards the middle. Lip thickness is not a problem. I've never had a student with, with wider lips that had any problem at all. There's your ideal, of course, right? And we don't get that very often. Okay, orthodontics are pretty obvious. Um, I did have a student once come in that wanted to play the clarinet who didn't have front teeth. Um, and it was very sad. And this child probably would have had to have had implants. And uh, so that's an odd example, but um, you, those types of things do happen. So you might wanna take a look and see you know, what do their teeth look like? Because if they're going, braces are, are not a huge problem, but if they have a dental issue that is going to be hard to correct, it probably will be. Okay, here's some, some good advice and I'll just let you read that. I'm gonna give you a second. I think it's really important to communicate with your students and find out what their goals are because sometimes they don't line up with what their parents' goals are or even uh, their teachers at school, okay? Um, and they know when they don't sound good. It's like the young man I mentioned earlier from Russia. I felt so bad for him um, that I just wish, I mean, I could have done more and I wish I had understood more at the time. So I could have adjusted my instruction to make it better for him. Okay, here's an exception. Okay, this is how this young lady started. Do it again, please. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the other one since we're getting close on time. And here's another example. Okay, not too good, right? Okay, look at the corners, low tongue position, et cetera, et cetera. Now here's another complicating factor. So we worked by holding this huge cup in her lessons to try to get her not to press down too hard on the keys, okay? Then it took us four months, four months to get here. So you can hear 
that the tongue position was low. And then it came up. Okay. And that's not a good thing for clarinet. And here's the end of four months. Okay, good. Now let's change that and do exactly what you said, which is bring everything up and in towards the mouthpiece. Okay, so she's the exception for months for that. Okay, I don't know if you can, I mean, she really wanted to play the clarinet, so we stuck with it. And I told her parents we would evaluate at the end of four months and we were able to make it work. And she went on and, and did well in high school. But that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing. Okay. This person, you never know who's going to be in your class. I had the best job in the world when I was younger. All I did was go around to middle schools in the Plano ISD school district and start large groups of clarinets. Sometimes I had 40 in one class. It was marvelous, just marvelous. Todd Coe, you just never know, right? Okay, um, one more thing. Here's my website. And if you have any questions at all, I have a bunch of stuff up on there for free. And you are welcome to go there and peruse um, and just send me an email and I will make sure that I get back to you. So I'm going to stop the share right now and we'll go back and see if anybody in the time that we have left, if anybody has any uh, comments or questions. Let's see, where's Jenny and Jessica? There they are. Right here. I haven't been seeing many questions, although I've seen a lot of wonderful feedback and comments. Some people asking um, if they'll have access to this PowerPoint afterwards. And Jessica and I will post this on the ICA website sometime after the event. Also, there is a similar one. If you guys want uh, to hear what it sounds like in a class example, where there were lots of kids playing with this methodology, it's on YouTube and it's posted by Van Doren. And it's different from the one I showed you today because this is one-on-one. -on -one. The other one is a class video, but it's on YouTube and I believe it's called First Year Curriculum. Very similar, but with large groups. And I do see we have one question. How about thumb rest position for the hand? That's a really, that's an excellent question. So it's funny, I don't micromanage that. And I'll tell you why. One of the first clinics I did in my career was in Arkansas. And there was a young lady that came in and her hands honestly looked like ET. And it looked like, I mean, seriously, it was like so far out that I thought, how is she covering the holes? And then when I looked at her, she was doing fine, but her hands, well, actually I would have told her to play the bassoon, you know? So I don't micromanage that. I look at the front of the horn as my guide. So if the hand position in the front looks good, then I don't worry about where the thumb is. But if the hand position doesn't look good, again, I go from the front and look at the fingers in the front and especially making sure that they look good and then the thumb position will take uh, care of itself. Because it, I just don't think you can micromanage that. There's too many different sizes of hands. And we have another question. Um, during the pandemic, a lot of lessons may have to be done online. Do you have any recommendations for teaching beginners online? That's a really good question. And um, the best piece of advice I have is to have them record something and upload it to YouTube to an unlisted channel so you can get a realistic picture of what they're actually doing. Um, because over Zoom, no matter how hard we try, I don't think the quality is just the platform's just not set up where we can really hear exactly what's going on. Um, when my students turned in their juries, thankfully, they sounded a lot better, you know, on their recordings than they did in their Zoom lessons. So I'm having them record and submit, submit that. All right. Well, Jessica could um, take over from here to see if there's any other questions. I'm going to get ready for the next panel. But Paula, so good to see you. Happy birthday. Wow. And Jessica, we'll take over from here. <laughs> okay. See you later. All right. I think I don't see any uh, let's see. Okay. What is your approach to students who don't use their tongue at all? Um, this is oh. a question from Facebook. 
This is a pretty common problem. Um, I've dealt with this myself, so I'm interested to hear what your solution is because okay. I'm sure it's better than what I came up with. Well, no, I, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. <clears throat> so um, I think you have to find a diplom diplomatic way to say this, but the tongue has to touch the reed. And so I demonstrate first to the student and they just don't want to touch the reed because it tickles and I'm going to do it on front of all these people. So I tell them, I said, you have to just stick your tongue out and touch the reed until they feel comfortable with that. And I, and th to me, that's the only way that you can really get the point across that the tongue has to touch the reed. Um, and I know we're real careful because to be qu quite honest, you have, when you frame things up, frame things up and word things, you have to be very careful how you say things, right? Because mis people misconstrue instruction, especially when you're, well, I'll just say it, talking about body parts, right? Okay, tongue and hands and all that, but that's part of what we do. So I would say, have them just physically do it um, and just keep working with them. Maybe try my he, t, t, and, you know, and see if that works. Um, and, and let me know. I'd like to know if, if you try that and see what happens. I've incorporated stop tonguing a lot of times yep. where I just have them play and then put their tongue, their whole tongue onto the reed. Stop the sound. The sound to stop and then pull it away. And even sometimes have them stop the sound and then pull the mouthpiece out and keep their tongue on it so that I can see it. Cause sometimes... And on Zoom, it's it's really challenging. And you're exactly right. The previous question is really challenging. Unfortunately, Jenny just informed me that we have to end this session to start the next one. So we got to move on. But we were really, really, really grateful to you, Paula, for this session. It was incredible. Um, those of you who commented on Facebook, I appreciate you watching. Those of you who joined us on Zoom. This video will be up on YouTube shortly after the session is over. I'm going to edit it while we got the other session going and get it up as quick as possible. Be sure to reach out to Paula. Her um, PowerPoint will be available on our Facebook, uh, not Facebook. I'll share the link on Facebook, but I'll also put it up on the YouTube uh, link and on the website. So yes, and it. Can you see me at Clarinet City. I Definitely. answer emails. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Bye. Bye.